Hey everybody and welcome back to the channel. In this video we're going to be taking a look at this Compaq Desk Pro 386S, a 386 based computer from 1988 manufactured by Compaq featuring the revolutionary Intel 386SX CPU. I mean, just look at this computer. Isn't this a beauty? It came with a matching monitor that I really like. It has this kind of curved design, which uh, I find aesthetically pleasing. I also have a compact keyboard. This is not the original keyboard, obviously, as this one has a Windows key. I do have an older compact key lying around somewhere, but I wasn't able to find it. But now let's see if the PC will start because the original owner of the PC told me that as soon as he turned on the PC, smoke was coming out of the monitor. Now this wasn't the case at first, but as I was playing around with it, all of a sudden I heard this kind of, you know, burning sensation in the PC. And I have to say it got me startled. I mean, in all honesty, I started panicking. So I picked up my camera and I tried to locate the source of that fire. But I couldn't really see anything except for a little bit of smoke that was kind of oozing out of these monitor vents here at the top. You can barely see it, but it definitely startled me as soon as I heard that there was something wrong with this monitor. So I immediately turned it off. Looks a bit foolish now in retrospect, but in reality, it felt like the entire thing was on fire. And yeah, just to prove to you guys that I'm not making this up by reviewing my action footage here in slow motion, you can clearly see that smoke is coming out of the bottom of the monitor there where the power section is. And as I was doing some research on the Compact 386S, I stumbled upon this video from PC Retrotech, which I will also link in the description below, and I will try to put up a card here, who had the exact same issue, I also smoke coming out of the monitor. In his case, it was a Rifa cap that exploded. Definitely check out his channel. He has a couple of interesting videos on this Compact and lots of other cool retro content as well. Now, luckily, I do have another compact monitor. It's not the same, but it will do for now. So with the renewed hope that this computer monitor will not catch fire, I decided to turn on the machine again and see what she was capable of. And that doesn't seem to be a whole lot at first glance because the hard drive didn't particularly sound healthy. It was more like an ambulance. The computer was able to start, so the floppy drive was initializing, but also that floppy drive had one or two issues as it was unable to execute or load certain applications from the disk. So yeah, turns out we have our work cut out for us, but let's see what this computer is all about. So we have a lovely desktop case, Compact Desk Pro 386S. We have this slim uh, drive here, disk drive. 3.5 inch. I wasn't able to remove the floppy disk that I inserted initially, so I had to use a set of pliers for that. So yeah, different form factor here, so um, nice little power switch. Uh, two LEDs, one for the power and one for the hard drive. On the back, pretty standard stuff. We have the power supply connector. We have PS2 ports for keyboard and mouse. So this is a computer from 1988. We have a printer port, a serial port, and a VGA port. We have a key lock on the back and four expansion slots. Now Compaq uh, typically uses these thumb screws here to uh, open and close the computer case, which is a nice touch so that you don't really need any tools to get in there. So by uh, opening up these three uh, thumb screws on the back, we should be able to slide open the case as I'm going to be doing here and see what we find inside. And yeah, so what we find inside is a pretty non-standard layout. We have a little bit of documentation here. We have the dry bays here. We have an exhaust fan. We have a weird looking power supply that takes up the entire depth of the case. We have one expansion card with a motherboard beneath it. We also have the PC speaker. In the documentation here, we see uh, the model, which is the Compact 386S. We have three switches on the motherboard, it seems. 
we have some jumpers, and we also have some information on the expansion card, which is in this computer, which appears to be a memory expansion board. So yeah, that's going to be interesting to look at as well. On the side of the case here, we have some information on the various uh, dip switches. So that's always interesting to know. This uh, revolves around, you know, the memory configuration, whether or not you have a floating point unit. But for now, we're just going to be taking a look at the only expansion card, which is in this PC, which is a very big card here from Kingston Technology known for its memory modules, obviously. So this is the memory expansion card that we'll be looking at in a bit. Here we have the floppy disk drive and the hard drive. And the connoisseurs among you, or the ones that have been paying attention to my previous video where I discussed a couple of ancient hard drives, will probably recognize the hard drive which is included here. But we'll take a look at that in a minute. First, we need to get this section out of the case, which is the drive base section. So there are a couple of screws here which hold this little assembly in place. And as soon as we remove the screws, we should be able to pull off this entire thing. We just need to remove the top cover here, which included that little bit of documentation, which is a nice touch. And after removing that, we should be able to remove the entire drive bay. I forgot to unscrew two screws here, and it's always a good idea to disconnect all of the drives before you do that. But then it just pulls on up like so, and then we can just get it out, giving us a better view of the main board. Now, these computer vendors like Compaq, Dell, they were very creative in terms of storing these uh, drives in their respective drive base. For example, here we have three compartments. We have one for the disk drive, the hard drive is below, and then there's still room to put something in between. But they are all these kind of custom chassis or frames that they need to be uh, going in so that's you know one of the downsides of these proprietary models that it's not that easy to replace them so let's first get the disk drive out here so two screws are holding it in place and then the thing just slides on out below that we have another half height compartment which i think is for another uh, floppy disk drive which is of a particular height and then beneath that we have the caddy with our actual hard drive. The hard drive, which is located in yet another caddy or frame that needs to be opened here, uh, is a Connor hard drive, so very recognizable. I do find it annoying that you have all these like brackets that these hard drives need to be slotted into. I mean, you have a bracket here, there's the bracket that I just pulled off, then there's the, the frame where it needs to be put in. So yeah, that's really annoying. One thing I have to give them, I like the fact that they are using all same sets of screws. They are Torx screws, so you need to have a Torx uh, bit here to work with these compacts. But the fact that they are all the same screws is really, really nice. But yeah, let's first take a look at the disk drive here. So there is definitely something in here, it seems. I can hear something rattling. Um, the disk drive is enclosed, obviously, in its own little chassis. So we can remove the front cover here. There is, you know, a special front cover here, so you just can't use any disk drive here. It also uses this proprietary cable here. Um, so there's only one cable going into this uh, disk drive, so there's no power, uh, separate power connector. And there's definitely something in here that we need to get out. So let me just get my set of pliers here to see if I can get it out. And wouldn't you know it, I mean, there is this, you know, floppy disk uh, shielding that got trapped in here. So that's probably why it wasn't able to read my disk. Pretty proprietary disk drive from Citizen. This is the high density model, 1.44 megabytes. I think this computer also shipped with 720K uh, disk drives, but this is an upgraded model, the OSDA53B. Again, with the single uh, connector here, both for data and power. 
which is a bit strange because Compaq included this uh, little PCB here on the uh, floppy drive frame, which just translated to a you know standard 34-pin uh, floppy drive connector with a separate power supply connector. So obviously the motherboard supports you know a more standard cable layout. So not really sure why they went with. Uh, this solution here as they could obviously just use a standard uh, floppy disk drive as well I did want to clean it a little bit. So I took off the the top metal uh, cover I uh, cleaned the heads a little bit and uh, Also used some compressed air to get most of the dust and grime out So yeah anxious to see if this will work better now in terms of the hard drive, don't really have high hopes for this one, the Type 43 Connor hard drive. So this is a 40 megabyte hard drive. Um, it's the exact same form factor as a 40 megabyte drive that I used in a previous video, albeit this is a different model. This is the CP341i, standard IDE hard drive with the IDE connector and separate power connector. But you know, this one is making a horrible noise. The jumpers are set correctly. I'm assuming there's no issue there, but it, it basically sounds like an ambulance when you turn it on. You, it's like it's screaming for help. Next up here, we have the one and only expansion card in the computer from Kingston Technology, a card from 1988. And this is an external, you know, memory expansion card. So um, there is one megabyte of RAM on this card here, as you can see here with these eight chips. Now we still have room for additional memory chips, but if we had different sizes, we could also attach two daughter boards to this card here using these uh, four connectors on the board, giving us uh, access to even more memory. Okay, but back to the hard drive now. You can hear that it's not really actually starting up as it should be. It doesn't perform a seek. It's just this, you know, repetitive, tone that you hear uh, indicating that something is definitely up here. For obvious reasons, the computer is unable to detect the hard drive and as such is unable to boot from it. So yeah, that doesn't look really good. Now, some people suggest that you just give it a slight tap with a screwdriver like so. If for one reason or another, the heads got stuck on the platters, that should, you know, uh, de-block that some people also say that you know dropping it a little bit can also help some people say that swerving it like i'm doing here completely off camera is the way to go but you know none of these things seemed to work now for a minute i thought that it might be the cmos or bio settings that caused this hard drive to act up perhaps it wasn't properly configured obviously the date and time for this computer wasn't set the system options weren't set but I was able to burn the diagnostic disk from an image onto a bootable floppy. And by booting that, we entered the compact setup utility where we can not only set our uh, date and time, but we can also configure our disk drive size, which is 1.44 megabyte. We can even set the uh, numlock position on startup. And then we get this nice summary where oh, we have various aspects of the machine. The fixed disk drive isn't auto detected. So you can select from a number of hard drive types. So yeah, I try to use hard drive type 43, obviously, as this is the hard drive which was in the machine. But yeah, didn't really have high hopes that this would work. And my suspicions were confirmed because after startup, the hard drive was still making the same obnoxious noise and it wasn't able to boot from it. So yeah, what are we gonna do with this hard drive? The Connor CP341i. Well, you know my hard drive repair capabilities, so I'm not gonna go there, but for the viewers that watch my previous video, they know that I have the exact same hard drive that is working that could be an excellent replacement. It has a different model number. This is the CP346 as opposed to the CP341, but other than that, they are almost identical. 
same hard drive size, same hard drive type. So let's give this one a try. And immediately we are greeted with this wonderful hard drive noise. Unfortunately, the system was still complaining that the system options weren't set. It wasn't able to keep track of the date and time. So I had to redo that, indicating an issue with the battery. But this time the fixed disk was automatically detected as a hard drive type 43. And after a reboot, while I still got the system options not set, I was able to boot from the hard drive. So yeah, that's 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 a nice success here. And just look at the computer booting into Microsoft Windows 3.1 with the monochrome VGA driver. So no color at this point, but man, am I glad that we have a hard drive computer combo up and running here. So that's really nice. 40 megabytes of storage waiting to be filled with the greatest games from 1988. So yeah, really, really nice. But we do need to take care of that system options not set message. And that's due to this Dallas battery here on the motherboard. Now, luckily, this is socketed. So Compaq was nice enough to provide us with a nice little socket where we have this old empty Dallas chip here. So that's something that we need to replace. Now you can still get these new. I typically buy these from uh, RS Component. Unfortunately, the packaging was a little bit off. So there were a couple of pins that were bent, not something that uh, we can't fix. So just using a set of pliers, we will gently push these pins back to where they should be. And then hopefully we will be able to replace this uh, Dallas chip here. So yeah, looking pretty good if you ask me. So this is the DS1288-7 Plus to replace the DS1287. They are pin compatible, so this should be just a drop-in replacement and everything should work fine. Now, I do want to point out another option for replacing these real-time clock modules, and that's a solution provided by Necroware, which also has an awesome YouTube channel, by the way. I'll put a card up here, but he has created this little hardware project where he has this drop-in replacements for these Dallas uh, type RTC chips. They basically use a coin cell battery, so it is uh, very easy to replace the battery, and you just drop it in as a replacement for the Dallas chip, and you should be good to go. So yeah, definitely check out this project and check out his channel on YouTube. I highly recommend it. But yeah, let's now take a look at how our machine behaves with the new Dallas chip, and I'm expecting no issues. And this was indeed the case because after going through the setup routine one more time, all subsequent reboots only had two beeps and the computer was booting into the MS-DOS which was located on the hard drive without any issues. So yeah, it seems now that we have a fully functioning computer with a working uh, battery, a CMOS which retains its setting, a floppy disk drive which seems to work and a hard drive that can also boot two megabytes of ram and we are good to go all we need to do now of course is put everything back together again and that involves putting the hard drive in its chassis and putting its chassis in its chassis and then putting that chassis in its chassis so yeah all good fun now that's the thing that I don't really like about these uh, more proprietary setups. I mean, why go through all of the hassle in doing that? It makes everybody's jobs so much more difficult than it should be. But, you know, what are you going to do about it? In the meantime, I also found my original old compact keyboard, which fits this computer a lot better than the other one. And I also found a nice yellow compact mouse. So, yeah pretty nice system overall and i know what you all must be thinking now what is this fire hazard of a monitor doing on top of this compact 386s was it fixed well no it wasn't i tried to reproduce that burning fire in the monitor but i wasn't able to do so i even went as far as to stress test the system by spending a couple of hours playing Tetris from the Microsoft Entertainment Pack that was installed in Microsoft Windows here, but the thing just would not burn. 
I kept it open for several hours and the monitor just kept on working. I mean, can you believe that? I was closely monitoring the various reefic caps which were inside this monitor as I am pretty sure that one of those was actually starting to catch fire. Now I didn't see a whole lot of burn marks so it's not really 100% sure what was causing that smoke but in my experience it's probably one of those reefic caps but if anybody knows why the monitor just works and why it hasn't completely burned up then I would be very interested in knowing why. So yeah, I'm probably going to be replacing those refit caps, but that's definitely going to be in a separate video. For now, I'm just going to be uh, enjoying this machine a little bit. Perhaps see if we can do a part two on this Compact 386S. And in the meantime, I really hope you've enjoyed this video. If you did, please consider subscribing to the channel, liking the video, and more importantly, leaving a comment in the comment section below. I love interacting with you guys on these retro topics. And I hope to see you guys very soon. Take care, everybody. Stay healthy and bye-bye.